Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Uh, welcome to the entering the cybersecurity field uh, panel today. We're excited to be with you guys. And of course, we get the wonderful after lunch time slot. So hopefully everyone's uh, uh, eaten and gets to enjoy our session. Uh, I'll, I'll be your moderator for today. My name is Chris Camacho. I'm currently serving dual hats actually as the chief executive officer of a company called Ninja Jobs and a chief strategy officer of a company called Flashpoint. Previous to that, I actually was a uh, cyber threat executive at Bank of America. And this is a topic that's super important to me as I'm really passionate about making sure that the next generation of cyber talent is uh, getting everything they need uh, and getting advice, getting the education system and finding mentors so that we can continue fielding strong cyber talent uh, for our country and all these corporations. With that, I'm gonna introduce each of our panelists uh, by name and let them introduce themselves. And why don't we start with Stephanie? Hey everybody, my name is Stephanie Aceves. I'm currently a Director of Technical Account Management at Tanium, where I focus on building out our practice in Latin America. And prior to that, I actually worked on EY's external facing red team. So I have some experience in digital forensics incident response and also penetration testing, red teaming, and um, red team engagements. Happy to be here with y'all. Thanks, Stephanie. That's an exciting background. Uh, and Jack, Jack Cable. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Jack Cable. I'm an election security technical advisor for CISA. Um, so here at CISA, I work on helping states um, better secure their infrastructure. Um, as well as um, coordinating some activities um, to combat foreign disinformation. Beyond that, I'm also a student at Stanford where I study computer science and I've um, yeah, just been involved with security for a little while through bug bounty programs. Thanks, Jack. And last but not least, Kyla. Hi, everyone. I'm Kyla. I'm 18 years old and I'm also a student at Stanford University. I'm also the founder and chief executive officer of Bits and Bytes Cybersecurity Education, which is a national nonprofit that's dedicated to educating and equipping all vulnerable populations in cybersecurity training and awareness. And I'm also the co-founder of GirlCon Conference, which is a premier youth-run tech conference that unites professionals and students together to discuss closing the gender gap. So I'm very excited to be here today. As I mentioned, it's quite an exciting panel that we have and quite diverse. So uh, thank you all for taking the time to be on this panel uh, with us for CISA. And with that, why don't we just go ahead and jump right to it, get to some questions and give uh, the audience uh, some topics that they might be interested in hearing from each of you. So to each of you, and we'll start with Stephanie and Jack and Kyla, we'll go, we'll go in that order. What do you recommend to the audience who want to get started in cybersecurity? Yeah, so we get this question a lot, I'm sure, um, you know, I, I get this question a lot personally. And I think the first step, if you are trying to get interest, or if you're interested in cybersecurity, you wanna get into the field, is to figure out what that means for you. You're going to see that there are a number of different things that you can do in cybersecurity, whether you have a proclivity to be more technical or whether your desire is to be cybersecurity parallel or cybersecurity aware and be more on the strategy risk advisory side. There are a number of different roles that you can take. So I think the biggest and most important thing is to figure out what it is that you want. You know, are you are you trying to get into a position of management? Do you want to take leadership roles? Do you want to be entrepreneurial? Once you have a vision of where you want your career to go, it's going to be easier to pin down what kind of roles would fit that and what that path looks like to get there. Thank you, Stephanie. Jack? Great. Yep. So, yeah, at least for me, I come from, um, of course, a technical background. So um, my advice will be more for that. I think it is just really helpful to kind of learn by doing. So one of the really great things with security is there's so many resources out there that like, no, you don't need a degree. You don't need formal training to get into it. There's loads of resources available, many of them for free um, on the internet that you can get started with. Um, particularly where I got started was through bug bounty programs where companies ask anyone in the world to look at um, their software for vulnerabilities and they'll actually pay you if you find vulnerability. So I think doing that can be a really great way just to um, kind of start finding real vulnerabilities, making some money along the way. And there's been some really great resources out there as well. Some of the bug bounty platforms offer um, their own um, 
training resources that um, really help to kind of get started in here. So I think I really recommend that as well as um, I think just starting to code is also really helpful for a technical career in security. Um, they go hand in hand. Um, so learning that in parallel, I think is also super useful. Thank you. And Kyla? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, I just want to echo off the advice from my fellow panelists too. In addition to learning some of those technical skills and definitely getting your feet wet with coding, I would also suggest to learn more about the context around cybersecurity and particularly our time living right now. So subscribe to some really great podcasts and newsletters. As Jack said, they're free and they're available out there on the internet now. So some of these include dark reading or CyberWire Daily, but just listen or read for you know 30 minutes every day because every day there's new vulnerabilities, new countries, new players in cybersecurity. So really just finding yourself amidst that context and learning more about it there. And also what I would say is you can also connect with security professionals on Twitter or LinkedIn and, and start building your resume and social media accounts to be more security centric, especially if you're thinking about a career, as Stephanie and Jack mentioned, in cybersecurity. Thanks, all great answers. And I think the big takeaway I would I would take from this is be curious, inquisitive, and just do your own research onto what's it gonna take, right? Listen to all the advice the panelists gave you here. And really, if you wanna get into cyber, then get into cyber. Just start, you know, reaching out and asking for help, learning on your own, and get to that path to be in cybersecurity. Uh, next question to all the panelists, uh, Stephanie, how do you build a brand to get noticed and be successful? Uh, building a brand requires authenticity, right? And so if the end goal is to be noticed, you have to be noticed for authentically who you are because anything that is not that is gonna be incredibly abundantly apparent, right? So first things first um, is really figure out what your goal is. Why, what does that visibility serve? Is it for personal professional gain, which is fine. Maybe you wanna um, get that visibility so you can network for your next role. Um, maybe you're doing it in a way to give back to different communities, kind of like Kyla's doing, right? There are a lot of different things and you kind of have to figure out what what's, what's driving you um, and then try to figure out what that brand like what that audience needs from that brand, right? So one of the things that I say for my own personal branding, um, in my own experience, I started off, um, I'm not from Stanford, I went to SC, so I'm gonna just put that there. But you know, I did my undergrad in computer science as well, and then pivoted into cybersecurity. And um, I think for a long time, I was still trying to figure out what my place was, right? I didn't want to be writing code, but I did want to take advantage, like I did want to do the red team penetration testing side of the house. So what I figured out is, you know, kind of this transition from college into your full-time workforce, there's a little bit of unease sometimes in figuring out, do I belong here or is this something that I'm capable of doing, right? And so that was, an I, I think, an identity thing that I had... Um, worked to to improve upon and has become part of my personal brand because now what I tell students and what I tell people that I mentor and just peers in general is be unapologetically yourself and that has been the messaging that I've come with because what you don't recognize is cybersecurity first of all is a new industry I mean new in the sense that it's just now getting the momentum that a lot of industries have had it's been here for a while but now you're going to start to see a lot of different populations wanting to take their part into cybersecurity and get involved and that means that the status quo as is is not necessarily indicative or representative of every single person right and so there can be a feeling sometimes of do I belong um, and is my work here worthwhile or is am I good enough to do this? And in those situations, the answer is yes, you do belong. If you want a seat at the table, you have that seat at the table. It's just a matter of you believing it in yourself. And I found that part of that is this, this move towards being unapologetically yourself. Why? Because when you own your identity, I'm speaking as a a Latina who works in a predominantly male dominated field, who is the only female or was the only female on my team um, for years. And, you know, who is now responsible for, for different things in the company. In the beginning, it's so easy to just focus on the, okay, well, I'm different. And that's honestly, it's the easy way out, but that's not necessarily always the right option. Why? 
because instead of focusing on the differences in the way that they are shortcomings, I've decided and I recommend that people focus on the differences and the advantages of those differences provide them. That takes a certain level of self-awareness and a certain level of accountability to owning your authentic identity. And I can speak from firsthand experience. Once you get to that point where you are unapologetically who you are, I bring my entire Latina identity to work. My coworkers know who I am in work. They know it's the same as I am outside of work. Once you bring that to whatever it is that you're doing, your personal brand is going to be so in line with what you feel your purpose is. And apart from that, you're allowing people to relate with you on a very human level to get to that brand, right? So, you know, be upon unapologetically yourself. People know what they're getting when they when they see that. Um, for me, visibility is a big thing. You know, there's a quote that that has really resonated with me is she can't be you if she can't see you. So amplifying voices, doing that, everything kind of aligning with your purpose. So as far as building a brand, you really got to figure out what's driving you, what motivates you, then figure out in for those for that audience or for you know who it is that you're thinking what kind of content do they actually care about right if you're creating content if you're not creating content whatever it is as you're building your brand think about being authentically yourself um you know filling up and aligning with what you feel your purpose is and then making sure that you're projecting and portraying yourself in that way great advice thank you Stephanie. jack yeah i think that's really great and um kind of to yeah narrow down on the point of just like being yourself and showing what you've done. I think it's really helpful to kind of showcase um, different projects you've worked on, uh, vulnerabilities you've discovered, um, stuff like that. And I think really fortunately, um, this is now something that companies look for rather than just seeing um, like a list of um, maybe, maybe skills on your resume, they actually want to see stuff that you've done. Um, so if we're thinking about coding, for instance, just having a GitHub profile, putting up even if they're random personal projects you've worked on, it can be really helpful just to show that you enjoy tinkering around, that you enjoy doing this. Um, so I, I would say that just starting to yeah, put up code um, is is really helpful there. And then on the, um, say, vulnerability side, going back to bug bounties, one of the really great parts here is that they actually let you, after you report it, in lots of cases, they let you talk about it publicly. They let you disclose the vulnerabilities you found. Um, so this is something that I started doing uh, maybe a year or so when I got into cybersecurity, when I was still very new to this, I started a blog where I talked about some of the different findings, um, of course, after I got permission from the companies to do so. And that was a really great way, not only to um, kind of show what I've done, but there's people who want to learn from you, even if you're new, there's a lot that you can share. Um, so I would really encourage, say, starting a blog, posting write-ups about vulnerabilities you've found. Um, that's a really great way to um, sh share these vulnerabilities, allow other people to learn and start um, kind of interfacing with people in the community. Thanks, Jack. And Kyla? Yeah, I definitely um, agree with both my panelists. I think the most important part is finding your unique value proposition and then from there pinpointing what avenue would be the best receptor for that information. So for cybersecurity professionals, Twitter and LinkedIn is usually where they live and where that community exists. But then for the education audience, Twitter and Instagram are usually where they exist. And then for peers, Instagram is usually what the Gen Z are using nowadays. So um, if you simply want to avoid the realm of social media as well, you can always start with the blog and then put that out on different social media platforms to various audiences. And obviously, depending on your mission or your unique value, you'll cater that uh, to that audience, your blog. and pick which platform would work best for you. Um, personally, I'm like super passionate about the effects of education. So I also find it's a really rewarding way to get noticed by sharing your knowledge and sharing your skills back to your community. So I would say pinpoint areas where your community might be insecure or might even be hosting a local STEM event and then try and build some traction there by showcasing the new skills that you've learned in cyber. So sign up for each one of those and just keep saying yes and to each one of those opportunities. And then from there, just try and get your name out there to really build your brand. Awesome. All great answers. To be honest, I think my main takeaways from those answers were obviously be yourself, right? Be visible. And let me add one thing that I think is important for building a brand. Be humble, right? Uh, you have to understand that not everyone is at the same level, at the same pace. Not everyone may agree with your opinions or they may agree, but at the same time, if you're humble, I found that that's where successful 
um, cybersecurity executives always start with. And one of the things that they're always looking for in interviews, someone that's really humble. Um, to Jack and Kyla, what was the driver for your entry into cybersecurity or start your own companies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, kind of the way that I got into security was really accidental. So um, this was when I was still a sophomore in high school. I was um, programming for a few years at that point, was looking at a financial website, just playing with its API. Um, and noticed that there's a way to actually send negative amounts of money to other people on the website. So at that time, I knew nothing about security, but I knew that was really bad if I could steal money from people's accounts. And fortunately, that company had a bug bounty program, so I could report it to them um, and um, kind of see how useful this was to them. Um, so that was my start, knowing nothing about security, just stumbling across something and really just teaching myself uh, from there. Um, so I think that in terms of kind of, yeah, the, the development in this and for instance, yeah, with the company I started, it was really just seeing that like this was something that people valued, that um, they valued me looking at them to point out security bugs either through a bug bounty um, or contracting with them. Um, so that was why I went forward with that. Uh, but I think there's there's really a lot of demand space for people who um, have good eyes who can um, point out vulnerabilities who can um, help secure systems. Um, there's, I mean, yeah, people talk all the time about how there needs to be more people doing this. That was kind of, um, I just saw that there was demand here. Um, I like doing it. So that was what led me to get into it. Thanks, Ankara. Yeah, for sure. I think it's um, what I like about security is that there's so many different entryways. And I think this is one example of that. Like mine is so vastly different from and um, so for me it really came from um, I think the best way to say it is that like the, the quote that's like when one door opens or when when one door closes another door opens but if you don't see a door just build a door for yourself so for me um, I had just seen my community experience a massive data breach and I talked to the mayor in my community and I realized that there was no such education going on addressing these issues before the next one happened. So, and the whole data breach had happened because of a social engineering attempt. So from that, and also I saw my brother experience cyberbullying from a very young age. So I kind of knew that some behavioral change had to take place and had to happen in the security community and outside of it um, because security and safety were thought of as some far off IT issue and we needed to make it more human and more personal. So um, from that point, I just kind of spent every minute that I wasn't in school freshman and sophomore year of high school going into different classrooms and telling them about threats that I had researched and who are the threat actors um, and things like that. And then that kind of turned into a lot of different companies wanting to uh, hear my perspective as well as just how do we build these kind of programs. So then I started working with IBM and Facebook to kind of create these creative utilities that we could give to schools and other vulnerable populations to help um, kind of strengthen and equip every population. So um, I guess the biggest takeaway from that is just um, the realization that that security is so human and so personal. And um, I keep realizing that through things like the Twitter hack, which just happened recently, which was just caused by voice phishing. And so just um, keeping that in mind, as well as realizing that um, not a lot of people outside know about security. So kind of catering uh, to an unmet need is the biggest thing. And it was unmet at the time. And so that's why I just kind of took it on myself to start something that I didn't see in the community. That's exciting for both of you. Good luck with the companies as as they mature uh, and you guys grow them. That's really amazing. And Stephanie, what was your journey into cybersecurity? So um, mine's, I blame my uh, very strict Hispanic parents because I had to turn in my phone when I was eight or up till I was 18 at 8 p.m. every night and they had all these very strict rules. And so I wanted to defy them and basically was kind of like Jack was saying, like testing different things um, and was able to kind of become security aware or we'll say technically aware um, back in high school. Now I'm significantly older than you guys. I feel quite old, though I'm not old, so I'm 28. Um, but basically back in that time, computer science or cybersecurity, that wasn't a topic that we were learning about in school. 
So I got lucky my senior year of college. Um, and again, kind of going on with this like villainous part of me that I always like to play around with. I took a class at SC that was supposed to teach us how to pick a lock. And it turns out that class was from hackers to CEOs. And so um, it was my senior year. By then I was thinking I was gonna go into software engineering full time and actually connected with the professor, one of the, the folks that had actually developed the program at USC and um, worked with my advisor to switch my course load into cybersecurity and to basically take off any of the electives that I would have had to have taken that were a programming specific, but not cybersecurity specific. So the big transition for me really happened and I, um, you know, accredit a lot of this to, I credit a lot of this to um, a professor that I had. His name is Joseph Greenfield. Uh, I think he took uh, um, basically interest in helping me develop my career and connected me with the right people. And so that's kind of how I basically out of college got lined up to do a, um, to work in incident response. Now, for anyone that's not aware, um, incident response, basically investigating these large breaches. By the time I was graduating, I graduated 2014. That's when all the major breaches were happening. So these are your large data companies that all of a sudden like security is just flipped and it's, it's a boardroom issue. Security wasn't getting a boardroom funding up to this time. And so all of a sudden companies were like, this is something that we proactively invest in. So I worked at EY um, on the uh, incident response team for about nine months and recognized, this is where I say, figure out what you wanna do because there's a lot of roles. What Jack is explaining, the, this um, bug bounty, that's a lot of kind of vuln testing. You're gonna be very technical, right? Um, I had a desire to be technical, but I started off in a role that just given the nature of the company that I was working for in a consultory advisory fashion, we weren't doing a lot of the investigations that I was hoping we would do. I wanted to be hands-on keyboard doing all types of um, assessments, investigations, but unfortunately we were in a more advisory role at the time where I was doing a lot more um, policy planning st strategy, right, for the first nine months of my career out of college. Now, I'll tell you one piece of advice that you guys just should know. If you're not happy in a role in cybersecurity, get out, like switch, because there are too many roles that need people for you to stick in something that's not filling who you are. You're not going to be as productive as an employee. You're not going to get what you need out of that career. And there's so many options out there, right? So what I did is I worked with my team um, and ended up switching to the red teaming role red teaming, penetration testing, these are your ethical hackers, right? Your white hat hackers. And so I switched into that role at that time and it was a lot more tech technical. It was hands-on the entire time. Also some soft skills required for report writing, but essentially I kind of just started moving towards things that I enjoyed and was willing and able to pivot as necessary if I felt like I wasn't um, in a role that was really sustaining what I wanted. And I'll add, when I did make that pivot from a blue team side to a red team side, be ready to walk. Don't feel like you have to be at that company because not every company is going to have the resources to be able to switch to switch you internally. So I, I did go in with um, a separate offer in hand, telling them, "Hey, I'm I'm prepared to leave. You know, is this possible? Right? So it's okay. You're not. And I I know this is like the millennial Gen Z thing. We're not tied to a company. So I for most of you guys that are probably watching, that's not news to you. But just remind remind yourself, you know. You don't owe the company that um, that loyalty if you don't feel like you're getting the technical exposure, expertise, or career growth that you want. Thank you, Stephanie. Actually, and I can relate. I've had I've, my parents are also Hispanic, so I grew up in a Hispanic household, and I faced those same boundaries. And my goal was always to break them. So that's that's great. Uh, to Jack and Kyla, uh, what can schools and universities be doing better to get students into cybersecurity, and how can we get kids started even earlier before even going into college to think about cybersecurity. Yep. Yeah, I've thought a lot about kind of just seeing being a student at Stanford, seeing how they teach security, who it's taught to, just thinking about how um, universities can do a better job of exposing more students to security. Um, and even beyond that, um, say students who don't necessarily want to have a career in security, but maybe work in software development, they still need to know something about security. Um, so what, what I see as a problem right now, I actually researched the top 20 universities for computer science in the country, and only one of them actually requires security as a requirement to graduate with a computer science degree. And I think that's problematic, not only because um, they're not exposing students who might be interested in security, who might be interested in having careers, 
um, in this field to that. Um, a lot of people are missing out from that. Um, but even beyond that, um, like I said, if you are a software developer, you are by nature developing code that can be exploited. So security is a part of your job. And I think that universities are doing a disservice by um, not teaching students the fundamentals for security when they're doing that. Um, because like, yes, not everyone's going to work in security as a security professional, but everyone's code is going to involve um, security at some level. And we can't just leave it to the security professionals. So I think from that perspective, universities could do a lot better in exposing students um, to security practices when they're starting. Uh, when they are getting their degree, just so then when they go out into the workforce, um, we're not seeing um, people who um, just um, are writing code without kind of thinking of what the security implications are. Um, so I think I'd, I'd say that's really one of the big takeaways is that universities need to think of security as a core component of computer science rather than just an adjacent topic. It is something that affects everyone. Thanks, Jack. And Kyla? Yeah, I think my answer and response goes hand in hand with Jack's as well. Um, well, first of all, I think we need to start including cybersecurity education in state education standards. Um, right now, only three states out of 50 have cybersecurity standards for teaching and educating, which means that lots and lots of teachers uh, and schools don't really feel empowered to teach security in the classroom because it's not in their regulations or their standards to teach. So that's number one. And then also protecting the schools themselves. I think a part of the reason that teachers feel so vulnerable, like they don't know security and enough to teach it, is that we are seeing so many schools face their own increased cyber threats, not only because we're in this virtual learning environment, but there's also, even before the pandemic, we were at a huge impasse when it came to cybersecurity in the education industry, both detecting cybersecurity threats as well as protecting the students themselves. Because only 15% of schools um, said that they had like a cybersecurity plan in place and only 29% purchased cybersecurity products and services. So another part, I think this all falls under the umbrella of empowering students and educators. Um, because that's really how you start and spark the conversation right now, particularly the gap is even wider for low income districts and students in that in those areas as well. Um, the second thing I would say is accompanying Jack's point to tying cybersecurity very closely to computer science. I would also say and encourage teachers and educators to find ways to frame cybersecurity in civics as well and realizing that cybersecurity can and should be integrated into discussions about current events, national security, civics, and computer science, um, especially right now when we're heading into this 2020 general election in the United States. This year, more than ever, a lot of the external actors are trying to use deceptive techniques, and I'm sure Jack could speak to this more as well, um, but using these techniques to manipulate students and young people, especially young voters. So we need to empower young people right now and um, there's even I worked with girls security this past summer and we launched an election security guide for students and teachers everywhere. So just finding new ways to integrate security into the conversation and then ensuring that those three states that have education, that number three becomes 50 at some point. Thank you. Great answers. And then Jack, probably important topic for this audience here. Can you provide some guidance into the federal government hiring strategy for cyber and how it can be improved? Yep. Yeah, I think that there's um, a lot, a lot of room for improvement for just how the federal government hires cybersecurity employees. Um, and I've experienced this in my own roles. Um, so to back up, when right after high school, I went to work for the Defense Digital Service, which is essentially, um, they call it a SWAT team of nerds at the Pentagon. So they run around um, breaking things and fixing things, um, making um, technology work better um, at the Department of Defense. Um, and um, so we established that I want to work for them. Um, they thought I was qualified for um, an internship there. Um, and went sit about to hire me and it took them I think it was um, at least six or seven months to actually get me on board because the government hiring process for people like me people who didn't have a college degree people who don't have kind of this formal background the government hiring process is broken to get these kinds of peoples in and working where they can contribute 
Um, so I think that we hear a lot of the time um, people talking about how the government needs more private sector talent, how we need to catch up in terms of our security, do what private companies are doing. And I think for that, if we want to get that private sector talent, we need to start hiring like the private sector does. That does not mean necessarily paying people the same amount. That's not possible. But what I've seen is that people are motivated by a lot more than money. They want to actually do something impactful and they want to be able to have this kind of um, authority to um, actually get important things done. And a lot of times you can, I'd say you can do even a better job. You can have more impact working in government, but our government just doesn't let people um, who are skilled do that a lot of times. Um, so I think that we need to, um, for instance, with the hiring process in particular, uh, we need to start having technical people actually evaluating these resumes, hiring people. For instance, when I was being hired um, at Defense Digital Service, they went through the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy said that I needed to have worked at Radio Shack or Best Buy um, in order to work um, as a security researcher for the Defense Digital Service because um, to the bureaucracy, that is the same. So I think we need to have people who um, actually um, can understand the technical details, evaluating resumes, um, hiring people based not on just kind of what you can write down on a resume, but what you've actually done. Um, I think that's, that's really a big start to get the government up to speed. And then another component that people don't talk about as much is that there's plenty of really talented people in government already in cybersecurity. The problem is that a lot of times they don't have the ability to actually do work that matters um, because their talents aren't recognized. They're not um, given enough flexibility to um, actually do that kind of important work. Um, so I think there also needs to be work to get these people who are in roles where perhaps they're um, not satisfied with what they're currently doing. They're very skilled, but can't put their skills to use and actually give them the ability to do that. Uh, versus right now, for instance, a lot of these people leave um, um, to the private sector. Um, so I think we kind of need to attack that both from bringing new people into the government, but also um, thinking about how we're allocating people currently and how we can better empower them to, um, to this important work that we all, all agree that. Um, is desperately needed. Thanks, Jack. Great answer and good advice as well. So in the interest of time, because we're coming up right on time, why don't I direct this question to Stephanie and Kyla? Um, what made you passionate about joining the cybersecurity field? And what advice would you have for the next generation or, or for all of us with regards to increasing diversity and inclusion in cyber? Stephanie? So what got me like excited and passionate um, I just like the idea of playing the villain, to be honest. So I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of being able to break things, right? Um, pen testing so it involves different levels of, of that kind of skill. So there's social engineering. You know, we did assessments where we had to do physical um, entry into buildings, right? So socially engineering security guards to let you in after hours or to let you in through the, the fright elevator, um, things like that. Then there's also just this whole concept like cybersecurity to me is such a cool field. When you think about it, it's warfare, right? You start to think tactics and, and techniques that adversaries are using. And then if you detect an adversary in your environment, maybe you don't want to respond immediately because what does that do? That tips off the adversary that tells them, hey, I know you're here. I'm going to go ahead and if I'm the adversary, I can either lay low, I can stay quiet for a month, a year, however long I need, or I can detonate whatever attacks I knew I was holding on to. If I have ransomware in the environment, if I have any other type of attack, I can start data exfil. So you start to see like there's this really cool psychology aspect of it. And that was what had drawn me specifically into cybersecurity. Now, the second part of the question, Chris, you were asking about how do we get more um, diverse candidates involved or what? what okay. So yeah, um, I think there's a number of different things. Um, I think Kyla's organization, her company is probably one of the best ways to do it, right? Start start basically nurturing these communities that maybe don't have access to the same resources. A lot of us come from um, maybe a position of privilege because I had a computer when I was growing up. That's not something that is guaranteed. Uh, maybe now it is, but or maybe it's more likely. But when I was growing up, that wasn't necessarily something that was guaranteed. I also had the luxury of 
um, having a family who could afford to send me to a university where computer science was even there or, or going living in a school district that had an, um, an engineering program and an advisor, like I had a physics teacher who got me involved in robotics in high school, right? Happened to be a female. So recognize you know, your privilege and use your privilege as an advantage to carry on the next generation of folks, the next, you know, um, generation of people that you see that that you want to bring that diversity in. The I think of some of the issues that we face um, with respect to diversity is that a lot of organizations focus on the diversity aspect, but there is no follow through with retention with regards to inclusivity, right? So a lot of diverse candidates, um, you know, I can speak from my experience, it can feel consistently like, okay, well, do I have a place here? I do not see anything that I um, relate to in my colleagues. Now, a lot of us maybe just get used to it, um, but that's where you know I, I loop it back to that being unapologetic. When you start owning your identity, what you're doing is you're giving people permission to own that identity with you. So I can talk to my co coworkers about a carne asada or some guacamole that I made on the weekend, and I can tell them about mariachi. I can tell them everything about my culture, and it gives them permission to celebrate that with me. And that, in turn, develops these really authentic relationships with your coworkers that increase retention. So you're only helping yourself by by owning into who you are because what that does is you now have coworkers that you can call on the weekend or text on the weekend if something hits the fan and if you need some backup or hey i trust you now where i can ask you a technical question that i might otherwise not want to like let everyone know but i trust you and i can ask that question so there's a responsibility for us to kind of keep paving the way for diverse candidates in the future. And if you are a diverse candidate, I really, really recommend that you lean into your differences, see them as the, the value adds that they are and own them because all that does is it, it gives you that seat at the table that you already had, but it allows you to believe that that seat was yours in the first place. Great, thank you. Uh, Kyla? Absolutely, that's amazing, Stephanie. I love that story. Um, so I think for me, um, it's kind of wild, like, like I think I actually saw myself as a, that I could be as a professional, uh, as a woman was when I saw Felicity Smoke on the arrow. And it's crazy to think about, but, um, I, I guess that just underlines the importance of representation, especially for young women right now. So, um, and I think to answer the second part of that question, and of course, after I saw Felicity, I went to a bunch of camps and started talking really to more researchers and exploring the, um, the psychology of hacking and as well as just getting into how do we make behavioral change with something like bits and bytes. But um, I think to answer that second part of the question, Chris, um, I think there's also a couple of things that I would say. So. In terms of the student perspective, just going back to what Jack had said about valuing students based on skill rather than qualifications or degrees or certifications, um, I think we need to make certifications more accessible to students right now. Uh, the costs associated with certifications make them an option for only a subsection of the population, and that really doesn't help us in the diversity and inclusion and including all the voices that are needed at the table and in the workforce right now. Um, the other part is, shifting some of the hiring processes. Um, I've seen positions that are, you know, entry level positions, but they require five plus years of SOC experience or something like that. So creating some more realistic expectations for students um, to come in and get that training on the job as well. Um, and the other part of it is, I guess, realizing that cybersecurity is an and gender issue itself is really important. I mean, in general, women are victim, victims of cybercrime at higher rates and 26% more likely to experience it than men. And they're also um, attacked by a slew of threats that is particular to women, like cyberbullying and cyberstalking. So I think also empowering the population of marginalized women as well and empowering peers students, even your children, if you're watching this and you have children, to gain a sixth sense about cybersecurity and become a little bit more aware of their own cybersecurity presence online, that'll make you a little bit more keen with the issues that are coming up in our future and also potentially allow you to consider it as a career. So just starting the conversation and also realizing and being um, proactive about the fact that this population of individuals is highly targeted as well. And I guess I would just close with saying that we need everyone's perspective right now and unique value as we were talking about before. So uh, please do consider joining the, the industry and, and I'm so excited for what's next. 
Wow, all great answers. Thank you. And if, if I may actually jump in here, okay, just because yeah. I think it's it's necessary for people like me to be talking about this to acknowledge that there's a problem and this needs to be improved. Um, I think that uh, one of the uh, components here that as an industry we need to address is it's not just about getting um, kind of a representative workforce, but then actually the problems that we're working on, making sure that that works for um, the entire world. Um, so there's a cryptographer, his name is Seni Kamara. He's a professor at Brown University, and he gave a keynote called Crypto for the People, uh, where he argued that um, really what we're doing right now, um, he was focusing specifically on academic cryptography research, was focused on problems faced by um, only a small portion of the world, predominantly white men, rather than um, what everyone in the world experiences, the actual problems that are there. Um, so I think that if we want to address this, if we want to say get people in the workforce um, who are excited about working on problems that um, can affect them, that can affect their communities um, and lead to improvement, I think we need to acknowledge that a lot of what we've done um, just doesn't tackle those problems. Um, so one example uh, which Kyle uh, was hinting on was, is known as intimate partner violence, uh, which um, can be really aided by um, a lot of um, technology. Google just recently announced that they're banning stalkerware, uh, which is used by um, partners to spy on um, their partners um, in instances of abuse. Um, so this is a real problem that we need to view as a cybersecurity threat, um, but it previously has not been viewed that way. So I think that we need to really think about how with the tools we're building, how we can make this work for everyone and not just a small group of people that um, were that have been traditionally um, kind of um, overrepresented here. We need to think about how we work, make this work for everyone. Um, and I think that's going to be a problem that um, the kind of industry has to um, think about at large. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and with that, uh, we'd like to close our session. Uh, thank you to Stephanie, Jack, and Kyla for all these great topics on uh, getting into cybersecurity. All great advice. I think the big takeaways for me are uh, do your own research if you want to get into the field. Uh, get, find some mentors that can help you, like folks in, in this uh, panel right here, and be inquisitive. So with that, be inquisitive, and if you want to reach out to us, find us on LinkedIn. I've seen that we are each out there, and we should be easy to find. Thank you, everyone.